Hello, space fans, and welcome to a special edition of this month's Future in Space Hangout. Now, for those of you who've never been to one of these before, this is a monthly event here at Deep Astronomy that is designed to give you a glimpse into humanity's future in space by exploring the latest science and engineering projects of members of the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society, the AAS squared, if you will. <laughs> Um, my name is Tony Darnell, and I'm really excited about this Hangout because, as I said, it's a special edition because, well, you all, got, you all heard what happened yesterday, and we were lucky enough to grab two members of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration to discuss yesterday's announcement that gravitational waves have been observed from two merging black holes. Now, this Hangout is a bit of a follow-up to the one we did back in November where we talked a little bit about Lisa Pathfinder with, uh, with Shane, at least. He was here before. And, uh, and it is currently at its position in orbit at the L1 point, ready to take data. And we should hear more about that in the coming weeks. And today, let me, uh, we're going to be talking, about, as I said, about gravitational waves. And next week, we'll have uh, Mike Brown and Constantine uh, Badigan, uh, available to talk about the possibility of a ninth planet in our solar system. So, with that in mind, let me get started with our introductions. With me, as they always are, my co-host, Dr. Alberto Conti. He's the Innovation Manager and Astrophysicist for Civil Space at Northrop Grumman. Hi, Alberto. Welcome back. Hey, Tony. Great to see you. Great hangout today. Yeah, I'm excited, too. So also, with me is Dr. Harley Thronson. He's an, he's an astronomer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and the brainchild of the future of space hangouts. Hi, Harley. Good afternoon, Tony. Alberto? Yes. Well, here we go. Are we ready for gravitational wave? Are you guys suitably rocked by the gravitational wave announcement yesterday? Just a fraction of a proton. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. All right. Belly Earth. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's pretty great. We're looking forward to our two guests today. Yeah. So let me. So without any more ado, let me let me go ahead and introduce them. Uh, with me is Dr. Shane Larson. Uh, he is an he's an astronomer with uh, Northwestern, and also you work with the Adler Planetarium, don't you? Yeah, I'm in a split appointment between the two institutions. So. Nice. Well, welcome. And he's currently enjoying the sun and fun in South Florida, which I'm very jealous of. But anyway, welcome, Shane. Also Thank joined. You. Uh, Dr. Jess MacGyver, she's a postdoc at Caltech, and she is currently sitting in the LIGO control room at which facility? Livingston. Livingston, Louisiana. So, mm -hmm. welcome. Uh, it's good to have you. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So, so yesterday we all heard the news uh, that the um, that are predicted. Uh, out from Albert Einstein that predicted a hundred years ago with the general theory of relativity that we should see these things called gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. And it took us a while, but we found them. And so, Shane, how about uh, you give us a little uh, summary of what happened yesterday? What, what, what's, so, what's going on? <laughs> so I think the best thing yesterday was the first you know, two sentences of the press conference where Dave Wrightsey, who's the director of LIGO, got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, we've detected gravitational waves. We did it. And uh, I wished he had just dropped the mic and walked off the yeah, stage. Yeah, he should have taken it. But it is exactly. It's a tremendous accomplishment. Something we've been waiting uh, uh, for a long, long time to do. Something Einstein himself had thought would be technically impossible early on in the 20th century. But uh, as you all know, we live in the future. And so we have technology and capabilities that Einstein never imagined. And uh, it's the harnessing of a lot of brain power and effort over the last four decades that have made this possible. Okay. Now, before we get too far along in the Hangout, I, I, I've been neglected, neglecting my duties. I want to remind you that we would like to get your questions and comments throughout the Hangout. So the best way to do that is if you're, doing, if you're watching our Hangout on YouTube, we've got the live chat enabled. Go there, and we are reading it right now. I am also monitoring, as you can see from my little lower third here, the Future in Space hashtag on Twitter. So please tweet your questions via Twitter that way. Also, um, via the chat box, and we're all, re we're all reading it. I've also gathered a few questions from space fans who watched today's uh, Space Fan News episode where I talked about this discovery as well. So just wanted to, just wanted to mention that to everybody. Um, okay, so Jess... Uh, how, how about um, how about do you, do you have any thoughts on what on on how this has all been uh, unfolding over the last couple of days? Oh wow, 
Um, <laughs> Have you slept? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I've been getting a lot more sleep now that it's announced than I had when we were preparing to make the announcement, for sure. Um, a lot of work leading up to that, I'll bet. Yeah, I think... We were all expecting it to be news, you know, we were expecting it to be in the press, but it, it really hit home when it wasn't just the top story on the 6 o'clock nightly news, it was also the top story on the the late night news, and it was the front page on many of the major print newspapers this morning, and that's just, you know, it blows my mind, and I'm, I'm so pleased that it seems like the whole world is, is really interested in this awesome science. What did you have up, Shane? I didn't see it there. What did you have up? Was that a newspaper article? Yeah, it's the USA oh, Today yes. that happens to be sitting next to me right here. <laughs> new window on the universe. That's right. It's, it must be great, though, to be a part of something like that and have it be such a widely uh, influential uh, discovery. I mean, I, I, it just must be an amazing feeling to be a part of a team that, that can do this kind of work or that's come, that's come up with this kind of discovery. Um, so here we go. We've We've... We've mentioned many, many times that this is something that Einstein predicted back when he first wrote the general theory of relativity, or when he first came up with it. And and uh, you were saying something in the green room before we started, Shane, about he actually he did something a year later after he published the paper with respect to uh, with respect to gravitational waves. Yeah. So he um, so so he wrote down general relativity in about two, uh, 1915 not 2015, and then in 1916, <laughs> we had a little problem before with dates, uh, right. in 1916 he, he discovered or had worked out that gravity had wave-like solutions, just like uh, at that time electromagnetism, yeah. and um, then it took him about two years before he worked out what we call the quadrupole formula. And the quadrupole formula is the kind of starting point for calculating how strong gravitational waves from astrophysical sources would be. And so once that happened, that was when we could start, start estimating whether or not these things would be detectable from things out in the universe. And the weird thing at that time was that they didn't know of any real astrophysical objects that had strong enough gravity to generate gravitational waves. They didn't know about neutron stars. They um, uh, had knew about the Schwarzschild black hole solution, but they didn't know where they that where black holes might come from. And so there was really no reason to expect that there were astrophysical sources of gravitational waves at all. It's a real testament to how far we've come, both in not only our theory, but in, in just our general observations of the universe itself. I mean, he was not very he was not very optimistic, was he, about the um, uh, Albert Einstein I'm talking about yeah, well, being able to see these waves or measure them at all was yeah. he? Yeah. Jess, I'll have you. Can you comment on that? Because I think. Oh no, go ahead, Shane. You got some background noise, so I. Yeah. Think so yeah. Well, I'm sitting in, uh, in in the hotel right now, so you kind of get it. <laughs> but he, you know, he could calculate the strength of the waves, right? And and as so, what we say in physics is there's no Hertz experiment, right? You can't. You can't shake something in the laboratory and make a gravitational wave that you can detect in an experiment. And it's because gravity is so incredibly weak. You need really super gigantic massive objects. And even if you make really super gigantic massive objects, then the waves are still really, really weak, as evidenced by the measurement that we made uh, you know, this five months ago. Okay, so... so Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did, I, did I interrupt somebody? Do you no, I was going to say it's also true that you know you cannot you cannot just take any object and just uh, rotate it. You know, the, you have to have breaking of symmetry of some sort. So that that comes you know back what the the quadruple uh, moment you were talking about, Shane. So it's so I think I said at the beginning, if you read the the, the record, it, it didn't really think we could have detected. And actually, when, once we're going to talk about how hard the detection was, uh, I think it was not far from the truth that you know you, you thought it was extremely extremely hard measure to make. And I think we're grateful that we actually have made a detection and perhaps we can talk about you know how LIGO went through a, a period where they had to improve significantly the detection capabilities. Oh, yeah, I want to go into that. LIGO, the instrument, as yes. before and after, so we're definitely going to go yes. into that. But before I do, I want to talk more about the gravitational waves themselves. What are they like? I mean, give us some sense of, I mean, we know about wave, we know about electromagnetic magnetic waves, but these are a little bit different, aren't they? These aren't the same kind of waves. These are waves in the fabric of the universe itself, correct? 
Yeah, so, so, so this is all really built around the idea that at, at that time, the whole notion in general relativity, that the establishment of general relativity, was trying to understand how we should think about gravity. And Einstein knew about Newtonian gravity, but it wasn't consistent with special relativity, which he had developed about 10 years before. And that development of special relativity introduced the notion that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. So he had to develop general relativity, a new way of thinking about gravity, to make it consistent with that. And so when he did that, he kind of changed the way we think about gravity. Instead of thinking about it like it's a force pulling you towards a massive object, he taught us to think about it, as we say, geometrically, that this, the, he just froze up. This, but geometrically meaning the sort of bend. But your, your connection's got really bad chain. That's a nice option. The consequence of force is pulling on you. Your motion is a consequence. We lost Shane. We, 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 we lost, we're losing you, Shane. Your, your internet's going bad there. So, Jess, could you finish that thought about the geometric aspect of the of the waves, how the, the bending of a... Uh, uh, well, w I'll just let you maybe follow up on that. Sure. I think um, this would be a good opportunity for us to show the video that was part of the press conference released yesterday as well of the two black holes and their effect on space-time. Okay. Would that be... Uh, let, me, let me pull that up while you're... While you're, you're talking. talking. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. All right. So, um, like Shane was saying, you need some acceleration of massive bodies, but it's really the um, acceleration of the quadrupole moment of the masses that produces gravitational waves. Is it this so, one? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. So you need some asymmetry. For example, if you had a perfect sphere, a perfect a uh, black hole or neutron star that was simply spinning, um, even though it's moving, it wouldn't necessarily be radiating gravitational waves. Um, so what this movie is showing us is, so space-time is the colorful um, sort of, I guess we, we call this a sheet, a fabric of space-time, and you can see this in greens and blues, and then where the warping of space-time is very strong in reds, and then the two black holes are shown orbiting above this space-time fabric. And as they in-spiral and get closer together, the amplitude of the gravitational radiation increases. They're accelerating extremely quickly. And also, um, you'll see the waveform evolution starts mm -hmm. increasing in frequency. They're speeding up. They're getting closer together. So this is, as Shane was saying, a very... it's much more easy to, to model this when you have two sort of um, point-like sources that are very massive um, orbiting and what the effect on space-time would be in that case. So this is the, yeah, this is a great illustration of the, of the, um, the, ge the geometric representation of space-time that Shane was talking about. You can see that these heavy objects, the black holes, uh, are actually affecting and warping the space around it. Now, Black holes, if you think about it, maybe they didn't know, uh, maybe he didn't know what would have caused a black hole, but certainly they are, they are also a prediction of Einstein's relativity because they are his most extreme prediction. If you take the idea that you can bend, that mass can bend space-time, well, this is the ultimate end of all of that, where something can bend it so much that not even light can get out. And so these, these black holes, as they're rotating around, you can see them affecting the space-time itself, in a really dramatic way. Now these, if I, I'm going to fast forward this to, this is where the merge happens, and we'll get back to that in a minute, but toward the end, if you watch this, you can see this kind of jiggly stuff coming out, emanating from the center of that of that merged black Jiggly hole. Jiggly being the technical term, yes. That is, it is, that's right, and, and I'm sure it's in the literature too. <laughs> so you see the waves radiating out. Got to be precise here. That's right. So you see those radiate. So what I would like to know, and what a lot of people have asked me uh, on YouTube and, and other places, is how fast do they go? How when they when you get a merging um, event like that, and you create these gravitational waves, how fast do they travel? And Shane, how are you doing on, on audio? I, can you hear me now? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay. Sorry, Thank you. guys. That was good. I just moved, and so hopefully it'll be better. So, okay, yeah, so how fast do they go is something that general relativity actually tells us. General relativity predicts yeah. 
that they should travel at the speed of light. Um, and so that's an uh, interesting prediction. There are other ideas about gravity that are extensions to or modifications of general relativity that don't predict that. Um, and in fact, that's something we can test with our LIGO data, and it's something we can test by comparing uh, both gravitational wave data from an instrument like LIGO and electromagnetic data if we have sources that we can see both ways. So, uh, so this is something we're interested in, but general relativity predicts that they move at the speed of light. Okay, Alberto, can you put that back up again? I want to ask the YouTube uh, audience in, in the comments, can you tell me when, when Alberto puts this up, do you guys see the wave at the bottom of it or do you, or do you just see our thumbnails? Because if our thumbnails are getting in the way, then you're missing some really important information that I want to get to next. So let me know in the comments if you can see that wave at the bottom of the animation. It's coming back up. It's sloping back up. There it goes. <laughs> okay. There's a wave along the bottom, bottom portion there. Um, a squiggly line. Yeah, it's a, it's a squiggly line. Those are the waves themselves. So they travel, you said they, they propagate out at the speed of light. Do they ever dampen? I mean, you know how waves in a, in a pond will get, um, will sort of go down uh, over? Right. Does that happen? So, 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 so they do decay away with distance the same way light does. So if you think about the total amounts or strength of the gravitational waves, uh, the way you think about the brightness of a star, as you get farther and farther from the source, the strength of those waves, the energy carried by those waves, um, uh, is spread thinner, is spread out, uh, and so they get weaker and weaker and weaker with distance. Mm -hmm. But they don't interact with matter very readily at all. So if they propagate through stars, they propagate through gas, um, they propagate through galaxies, they do not lose energy as a result of propagating through that material. And so what we say is we say that they are very weakly interacting, which is why they're so hard to detect, because right. it's hard when they to make it so when they go through LIGO, they do something we can detect, because they just very weakly uh, interact with everything they go through. Okay, well, they're telling me on YouTube, um, on the comments, that they yeah, can fine. see that wave, so that's great. So I'm going to put it back up big here, and this is, this is a re representation of what you guys, or what LIGO measured. And along the bottom are these, well, explain to us, um, and maybe, Jess, I'll have you do this one. Explain to us what we're looking at here along the bottom. So the bottom of that is representative of the space-time strain that an interferometer like LIGO or like LISA in the future would measure. So um, the strain of space-time is, is sort of the change in distance over distance. So if you were watching the press conference yesterday, Ray Weiss had this um, this mesh that he was holding up that was full of squares. And oh yeah, I saw that. He's, he pulled it apart. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and as you, so as the gravitational wave passes, let's say you have a ring of matter like this, it will, it will stretch and compress like this. Um, so this is... So it, towards the left there is, is normal unstrained space, presumably, right? And then as we get further along, we start to see some squ the squiggles do some other things. Well, you're, you're tracking the change in amplitudes of sort of, if you take a, a, a cut, like a razor edge, and you just slice across your sheet of space time, um, that's what you're measuring. Or let's, let's just say you put like a little, like a duck floating in a pond, and you're just sort of watching that duck is floating on waves of, in space time that are tracing out that pattern. Oh, that's such that's a cute image. I'm playing little duckies in space now. Aww. There you go. <laughs> You're welcome. They're just floating. They're just floating like little ducks. Okay. I've got how um, technical Science. and precise we get with these interviews. Hey, this is deep astronomy. We do it right here, folks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well okay. So, um, Alberto, I hate to keep asking you to put that back up. No, I'm going to put it back up. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, uh, we want to um, – by the way, that's a cool JWST clock you've got there. Yes, um, I do. And I want, and, and so I want to get to the measurement itself because uh, there's there is a characteristic shape that this wave has. Just go ahead and fast forward it if you can, and pause it right there at the the place where the um where the video pauses itself. Just kind of go to that spot. Oh, the frozen it. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you do that? Uh, I trying to do that. Uh -huh. nope. Sorry. All right. Well, here I can. Where, where I can, you want? Hang on, I can get it up on my. Where do you want it? Here? Oh, yeah, right there. Right, right where it goes to the part where it, where it freezes. Because that 
is a a characteristic shape to what you were you were looking for this exact shape, weren't you? Or at least something like it um, in LIGO, correct guys? So yes. the entirety of the wave is characteristic of the signal, but the reason that we focus on the end of it is because that that part that sweeps up to high frequency is what's in the frequency band that we can measure with LIGO. Okay. So this is a question I've gotten a lot, and Jess, I'm going to ask you, I want to see what you say about this. How do you know that what we're seeing here is two black holes merging and not some other event that maybe could uh -huh. be neutron stars or galaxies or something, or, or um, uh, Alberto's um, desktop? How do you yeah, know? Just <laughs> falling through the vacuum chamber. Right. How do you know it was two black holes merging? Okay, right. so let's, Perfect, Alberto. Leave it there. Let's break down that question into two parts. So one is, how do we know that it was this particular signal as opposed to some other astrophysical signal? And the other part of that question is, then, how do we know that this was a real astrophysical event and not some terrestrial phenomenon, a, you know, a okay. strike? Or yeah, I was going to get to that part when we got to LIGO itself, but go ahead and, okay, and we'll, do that. We'll, we'll save yeah. that for later. Then. Well, you can do it now. Um, it's fine. <laughs> so... The, um, the frequency of the gravitational waves that are emitted and we measure, the frequency and the change in frequency are governed by the masses, the masses that are in this binary system. So by measuring the waveform itself, we can infer with pretty good precision, uh, fairly good precision, what the system was composed of, what the two masses of the system were. Just looking at the, um, the structure of the waveform that's, that comes out of LIGO data. Okay, so the shape is what matters here, the actual shape of that waveform coming out. It would look different if it were something else, like a neutron star falling into a black hole, for example. It would have different frequency content, and it would the evolution of the frequency would be different. That's right. Okay, good. So that's fact, how you... it, would look, it would look different if you had different black holes, True. right? So if the black holes were spinning or if they were different yep. sizes, it would look different as well. Well, that's a good... That, okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up because they said yesterday... That one of the uh, that these were that this was an event of two, two merging black holes, but they were of about on order thirty solar masses. Yeah. Right. How did they know that? So so the the overall the overall strength of the gravitational waves depends on the masses involved. So in this case, the masses of the black holes. Sure. And then um, the 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 um, speed that the black holes are going around each other, right, gives you the frequency of the waves that Jess was just talking about. And smaller black holes can get closer together before they touch and make a new black hole, and the waves go away. Okay. So we can, which what the total mass of those two black holes is from the moment when they merge, and then those waves uh, die away. Okay, well, I was trying to share my screen while you were talking and unable to do that. So um, I, I, I think I've lost a key bit of functionality here. I'm really upset about that. So, Alberto, I'm really going to be depending on you for that now. So, the, okay, so the, the, the amplitude and the frequencies of these waves gives you all kinds of information. One more thing I want to know, and that is when they actually were able to tell us where it was coming from, in what general direction this thing was and in the sky as well as how far away it was. What about, what gave you that, what, from where did that information come? And I wish I could share my screen because I have your image. I think, I think Jess should do this. Okay. <laughs> sure. um, so we, we need, it's, it's necessary in order to do sky localization to try and get a sense of where this came from in the sky to have more than one interferometer. Um, so one of the great strengths of the interferometric design is that we're sensitive to gravitational waves that come, so they're, they're L-shaped. And if you have a wave that's sort of traveling in this direction perpendicular to your interferometer, um, that's the direction that we can see that we're the most sensitive to. But we're, we have fairly good sensitivity to pretty much all directions in space except for those that are aligned directly along one of the two arms. So this means we have a, a, a very good chance of detecting a gravitational wave that's 
passing through the Earth. However, that means we are not very well able to resolve what direction the, the waves are coming from. So we rely on, and so you, you might have noticed in the press conference yesterday that the two signals between Hanford and Livingston were off by about seven milliseconds. I think oh, it was it like. seven? I thought I had heard 20 at the thing, but uh, okay, so seven milliseconds. I'm pretty sure that that's true. I'm yeah. sure you... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, not, it, it is seven milliseconds. Not, no, 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 no. Twenty milliseconds was the total length of the signal. Correct. Okay. That's what Correct. it was. Yeah. Oh, thank you for clarifying. Okay. No, right. I was going you, Jess. <laughs> so um, you can you can tell from the difference in time. Um, in particular, you can uh, localize to a swath of the sky with two detectors, and then once we get up to three detectors that are online and taking data at the same time, we'll be able to triangulate even further, judging by the difference in time of arrival. Um, and amplitude um, between multiple interferometers. Okay. So I guess what Tony is showing now is exactly your your confidence level in terms of where the position should be, right? So yeah, what it, just, just describe this picture for me, Shane. What what's all these colors about? So those 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 contours we call it the banana usually. <laughs> um, the banana on the sky of where we think the source came from. What is that? Why do they call that the banana? Um. <laughs> so, so the outermost purple line that you see there, uh, that is, we're 90% certain the source is somewhere inside that purple line. And I think it's 10 degree increments down to the yellow. So you can see that as, you know, you get to the yellow, which is pretty localized on the sky, yeah. um, you know, we're only 10% confident it's inside those yellows, but we're 90% confident that it is in that uh, purple swath there. And so... So this is this is why we need multiple detectors, right? Is that if with just one detector, it's kind of like listening with your ears. You can tell there's noise around you, but because you have two ears, or if you had two people closing their eyes and pointing at you know someone talking, you can localize something pretty well. Um, if we add a third detector, so our partners in Europe uh, in the Virgo collaboration, they should be on in a year or so. This whole swath would have been something about 10 degrees across in the sky. So it would be much, much smaller if they had been online at, the, at that time. Maybe be a plantain by then or maybe a, a kumquat. <laughs> a kumquat, yeah, right. <laughs> or avocado shaped. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, that's good. So, And as this diagram is pointing out, it's somewhere near... Uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, um, which is our neighboring dwarf galaxy. So that's uh, it's it's somewhere up in here. It's where the event occurred. Nice. It's most likely in there. Most likely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, but once again, it's, it remind folks how at what enormous distance it is. So yeah. the distance for this was 400 megaparsecs. Yeah. So parsecs are funny astronomer units. If you convert that into light years, it's about 1.3 billion light years. How many duck lengths? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it will take a long time for a duck to walk that far. I know, but if you have if you had the row of ducks all the way, sorry, I believe that is an exercise for the YouTube commenters to, to uh, find out how many ducks it weighs. Yeah, there's no telling what kind of questions we're going to get about using duck lengths. <laughs> that's right, ducks in space. That's right. Okay, well, the, so uh, that was a good summary of what was observed and and um, when and where it is in the sky, and it's roughly one, you know, over a billion light years away, a long way away. And the now I want to talk about LIGO itself, the instrument itself. There are two of them currently in operation. One of them is in Hanford, Washington, or Hanover, Washington. The other one is in Hanford. Is it Hanford? I had it right. Okay, Hanford, thank yeah. you. Uh, and Livingston, Louisiana, where Jess is right now. And Jess, you are sitting in a control room of one of these things. Why don't you yeah. give us a little background on where you're sitting and what's going on there? And if we see, like, big red flashing lights, should we, like, uh, be, get excited? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I want to see an event. <laughs> yeah, we're ready, for, we're ready for events now. It's like, yeah. I have so, a few milliseconds of time for you. Oh, I see. So our, our first observing run ended on January 12th. Um, so we are currently undergoing some improvement time, so let me just rotate my screen here a little so you can see a little bit more of the control room. So sitting over here is our one of our operators, William, who I don't think hears me. Like, well, yeah, he probably shouldn't, uh, he probably doesn't want to be seen on TV. <laughs> he looks busy. Yeah, but, he uh, so you do things in runs then. It's not like a tele, well, it's like, uh, like telescopes, um, you know, uh, ground-based observatories, survey telescopes—they look in 
you know, in runs. So you you have specific. Well, describe to me what that's like. I mean, <laughs> just turn it on, and then just like, is it like just collecting data, and then you turn it off, and then you go look at all the data? What's it? What's an observing run like? And how long do it's, they last? Um, very good questions. Um, so there is a very large team that keeps. So the uh, I should start by saying the interferometers are very complicated. It's okay, not a matter of. Up. I got. Let me put that animation up. You want me to do that? The. Sure, yeah. Okay. How Liger works, yeah, it's a great yeah, animation. Let me put this up. Okay, can you can you see it now? I can see it. Okay, let me see if I can see. So this shows the the interferometers at their most basic level. So you have laser light that's split at a beam splitter, and then this travels down two perpendicular arms so that the light is in phase when it's entering the two arm cavities. It's reflected off of a mirror. Um, at each of the ends of the arms, so the, the arms are about two and a half miles long, four kilometers, so the light's reflected back, recollected, recombined at the beam splitter, and then what we measure fundamentally um, is the phase difference between the two paths of the light. So what happened there? All that, all the, the light, all the red stuff went away and we were just left with a few, did it all cancel out, and then what we're left with is the stuff that's out of phase? So um, what you're seeing, so in one arm is yellow and the other arm is blue, and so what you're seeing right now is total destructive interference, so the red light goes away, as you say. But uh -huh. if, you, if you play further in the movie and the arms start to move with respect to each other, then um, you get this change in phase that results in uh, a different interference pattern, which is what we're measuring at the photodetector, which is represented by the black square screen. Now let's let's be clear here. You're looking at space time moving here, right? That's that's jiggles <laughs> in the fabric of the universe we're looking at. The technical term. Yeah. Jiggles. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, the way to think about it is that the space along that arm is stretching. Yeah. And so the and way so the, the so the the laser takes longer to go down and come back than it did before the arm was stretched. Yeah. This little arrow is that pointing to what you're talking about the uh, the stretching part? Yeah, this this yeah. up this up here. Right. So if you if you watch the movie, what what you should see, if I'm remembering this correct, well, what you should see is um, as the interference pattern is changing, the two lengths of the interferometer arms are changing. So when they're static and there's no change in space time and local space time, then you get this destructive interference where the light comes back to the beam splitter and you don't see anything at your photo detector. But if your arms, if the, the space-time is being compressed and um, sort of squeezing and lengthening like this, then what you see is the arms in this video moving That's, represented. Yeah, so there it is. That's the strengthening, the lengthening and the contracting of the... Uh, That's right. That's, so look at that. Look at, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's okay. all in great. I'm, play, I'm, play, I'm playing with the interferometer, guys. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, uh, well, let's go, to the, let's go to how accurate this is then. We have another thing that shows um, this wobble or what the, the kind of sensitivity that it can, get, it can get. Let me find it here. Oh, my gosh, I have so many things up. Um, where'd it go? Let's see. Well, in the meantime, we can we can also ask. Uh, we're always thinking we can ask Jess or Shane uh, that you know I can think of a few things that can mimic uh, uh, that could cause interference. Let's say so you have to have a lot of controls uh, in order to remove um, events that are from uh, me uh, jumping up and down to a car to an earthquake to things like that, right? That can create those uh, signals. So so mm -hmm. so the, the the experiment is also complex because of the controls you have to have in place, right? It's enormously complex. So what you're seeing here is basically you have a laser and two mirrors and a beam splitter and a photo detector, but we have many different uh, other components, both directly in the optical path. We have different recycling cavities that uh, increase the power that's circulating in the arms um, quite a lot, to something like 100 kilowatts um, in the arms. Mm -hmm. And then you also have a lot of equipment that tries to minimize the impact of things like seismic noise. So once once we do see the, the video that shows us the scale of how precise this is, what essentially you're looking at are changes in length to the scale of a thousandth of a, the width of a proton. 
Okay, let me show you that now. This is yeah. this is how small the jiggles are, folks. I mean, this is how far. I mean, how, how sensitive that this is an atom, right? Where there's an electron whizzing around, and watch this. One the scale minus, at the ten to the minus fourteen, ten to the minus fifteen, and check it out. There's the side of a proton or something, I think. And then look at this. That's it. That's the signal that they're getting out of this. I mean, ten to the, look at that. It's, this is why minus. Einstein thought it would be impossible, right? Correct. Correct. Right. <laughs> So that uh, it didn't leave in the future, and we said at the beginning, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that is pretty darn sensitive, and there are two of them in the world, but that's not all. Let's talk a little bit about these other facilities that you've mentioned, uh, Shane. There's other places coming online that will presumably make um, not only get, I don't know if you get more observations, but you'll certainly get more accurate locations and things like that from them, right? Yeah, so, so all of the detectors working together is actually useful because, um, as we'll talk about, one of the ways we distinguish between astrophysical sources and terrestrial sources is you want to see the same signal in all your detectors. And so as we add more detectors, that gives us confidence in, uh, in the things that we're seeing. So right now um, in the world, LIGO, the two LIGO detectors are the ones that are running. Uh, or are, are operational. Uh, the European collaboration, uh, Virgo, uh, is building one outside of Pisa. It's a little bit shorter than uh, LIGO. It's at three kilometers. Okay. And they'll be online uh, next year, I think is the current plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese are building one in the Kamioka mine. So that's a location of a famous neutrino detector. People oh, are, uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, okay. so it's in the Kamioka mine. So that's called Kagra. And it'll, they're, uh, they're constructing, and it'll be a few years before they're online. Um, there's a German interferometer. It's a cryogenic one, right? Yeah. So um, the Germans have an interferometer that's 600 meters long. It's called GEO-600. Uh, so it's, it's smaller than the others, so it's not quite as sensitive, but we do a lot of our technology development at GEO. Mm -hmm. And so they've, uh, they've been instrumental in helping us get from initial LIGO to advanced LIGO. Um, um, and then lastly, oh, sorry. So the no, last, ahead, one, the last one. Yes, yeah, yes. the last one is uh, in the early 2020s. We're hoping to install a LIGO in India, and so it'll be identical to the U.S. detectors. Okay. Uh, and that's a partnership between LIGO and India, and so hopefully right. that will that will happen. All right, guys. I am seeing your questions and comments on on YouTube and Twitter, and I will get to them. I promise. I want I want to just. Um, before we go, leave this topic of the LIGO Observatory itself. Jess, can you comment a little bit? Now you're calling it the Advanced LIGO. What you've been LIGO has been looking for gravitational waves for quite a while, yeah. uh, and you did some up. It didn't see anything directly. I mean, I'm I'm told there's lots of indirect uh, uh, measurements that have you know shown gravitational waves, but um, LIGO didn't see anything, at least not directly. What Happen? What did you guys do? Did you guys like get better detectors? What is the A in advanced LIGO? They turned it up to eleven. They turned it up. To <laughs> we we got more ducks. Got more ducks. Ah. <laughs> See, you knew it. So and better it's um, too, I'll bet. <laughs> they made larger protons. But that, but that's a great question. So I'll let you just answer because I have another question over this. But it's a great question. Go ahead, sure. Jess. So uh, I think it's useful to put this in the context of the history of the LIGO program. So when the NSF first um, first funded the LIGO program, the plan all along was to upgrade. We we knew that it was very unlikely with the ori original initial LIGO sensitivity that it, we would probably not see anything. And even from uh, the, the earliest dates of the plans, we, were, we had meant to upgrade our technology. So um, the last science run of initial LIGO ended in 2010, and then from 2010 to 2015, uh, essentially, pretty much only the vacuum chambers and some other um, odds and ends stayed at the LIGO sites, and everything else was stripped out and then replaced with upgraded technology. Um, so there's three major changes between initial LIGO and advanced LIGO. So one is laser power. So at higher frequencies, we're more, most fundamentally limited by shot noise. It's essentially, as we were showing in the video, a, a photon counting experiment. 
and you get a lot less noise relative to your signal when you have more power circulating in your arms. So one of the changes that was made, we have a more powerful laser, and we've also improved, we've added a recycling cavity. We now have both a power recycling cavity and a signal recycling cavity on either side of the beam splitter that catch the light and send it back um, down into the what arms. What kind of laser is it? Do you, what, what, what wavelength is the laser? It's a 1064 nanometer ND YAG laser. 1064, okay. So, and, and presumably, do you have a rough idea of its power output? So the, during the, um, the first observing run, it was 20 watts, and this was recycled <laughs> to the point where it was 100 kilowatts in each of the two arms. No way. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. All right. So go ahead. I, I interrupted you. I asked you about the, the laser, because when I heard lasers, I was like, ooh, okay. <laughs> ooh, laser, yes. <laughs> um, so, right, so that's what we did for high frequencies. For the middle frequencies, which is our most sensitive range, so something like uh, tens of hertz to a few hundred hertz, um, this was most fundamentally limited by thermal noise. So we're, when you're looking for such small changes in distance, you can actually um, have a lot of noise introduced by the, the atoms moving on the mirrors themselves. So we changed the material of the test mast optics and the suspensions to reduce this in that range. And then finally, and this is the, the aspect of instrumentation that's nearest and dearest to my heart, which is the seismic isolation. So we now have, for all of the major optics, um, active seismic isolation and improved passive isolation. So when I say passive, um, all of our optics are hung from suspensions, mm -hmm. and this reduces, greatly attenuates um, the noise. So I think above 60 hertz when all is said and done for our test mass optics, which comprise the arms of the interferometers, uh, we get something like 10 orders of magnitude attenuation to motion, which is really wow. impressive. Um, so we have suspensions, let's focus just on the core optics, so just the optics that um, make the arm cavities of the interferometers. We have four stages of suspension, so this is where the test mass optic itself is hung to a suspension stage, which is hung to another suspension stage, which is hung from another suspension stage. And this, four, this quadruple suspension, four-stage suspension, is hung from an active seismic isolation platform which is composed of three different stages. So each one of these stages is separated by um, like a series of springs. I think yesterday, a good analogy during the press conference was it's sort of like the suspension of your car, mm -hmm. um, makes the ride more comfortable, and limits the, the amount of bouncing you do based on the amount of bouncing that your wheels are doing. Um, but this is really cool. So for the, the active seismic isolation, we actually can measure the motion of the previous stage and then actuate to compensate, kind of like a, your noise-canceling headphones, but for motion. And the precision of these is um, uh, an engineering feat, let's say. Well, and I'm sensing some spin-off technology already. I'm thinking more comfortable car rides already and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. And I'm sure it was born out of, you know, keeping... Cars is gravitational wave detectors, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, spin -off, so. no, but I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask a, one, one quick question, which was the fact that, uh, you know, astronomers are very good at uh, extrapolating. So now we have one data point. We have one... Uh, so can we predict... We, we, we should be good at trying to predict what is the rate... Right, so uh, uh, LIGO has seen one. Why doesn't he seen? Why hasn't he seen twenty? Right, or a hundred? Right. You know? So what we can calculate probably what the rate of this merger, at least for these black hole mergers. I guess I'm not talking about neutron stars, but at least for this black hole. Do we know, Shane, what what the typical rate is? Or so so this is this is the real big uncertainty going into this is knowing how many times we would see something merge. And mm -hmm. in fact, you know, the, the, the probably the thing that's most surprising to us is that we saw binary black holes first. If you had asked all of us six months yep. ago what the first source we detected was going to be, we would have said binary neutron stars because yep. we think they're more common than binary black holes. Yep. 
And so also now... They give out light, which is also another important thing. Yeah, that's right. So they're connected to short gamma ray bursts. Correct, them. correct. Right, yeah. So, so in this case, you know, what we're all doing now in terms of analysis is exactly the kind of calculation you're suggesting. We're looking at how long we've been on, how many sources we've seen, and trying to estimate what the rate is, and then compare that to astrophysical models. Yeah. And the interesting thing about these black holes that we've seen is they're big, and there's a couple of different ways you can make 30 solar mass black holes. Both of them are highly theoretical and we don't have real good astrophysical yeah. observations to constrain them yet. So the goal now is to use LIGO observations to constrain those ideas we have about where these might have come from. And that's that's for the near future. The more observations we get, the better we'll be able to do that. Good. And I want to I want to point out while we're on the subject of, of the LIGO observatories as well that uh, Harley reminded me that this was a f these observatories were funded by the National Science Foundation, correct? Yeah. The ones, the one, these two in yeah, the, both they, LIGOs are yeah. Right. So this is a real testament to their investment, and and this was a long term vision uh, that they had seen, and they and they kept with it. And this is what happens when uh, you commit to a f solving a scientific problem, and it's really, I think, I, you know, just big props from my, from my as, a, as a citizen, as a private citizen, I'm really grateful that uh, the NSF was, was, uh, had given this a priority and had done it and stuck with it because um, it's been a long road, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you heard Franz Cordova, who's the director of NSF yesterday at the beginning of the press conference, say this. You know, at the time they funded LIGO, it was the biggest project the NSF had ever funded. Yeah, okay. And they knew it was going to take 20 years for us to get to where we are today. So it was a big risk on their part, but the NSF is in the game of taking those kinds of risks and getting us to this point where we can understand the universe differently than we have before. That's right, and it takes risks, uh, risks like this to find out the big, the big answers these days. So I have a question from Twitter. Let me get to some of you guys' feedback before too much time goes by. George Caldwell is asking me on Twitter. He's saying, can small events like novas and supernovae produce gravitational waves that we cannot detect? Well, first of all, do they, will they produce gravity waves, gravitational waves that we can detect? A supernova. Yeah, so anytime you have any any dynamic motion of mass where you're accelerating masses, you'll generate gravitational waves. So I've been talking with my hands here and I'm making gravitational waves every time I do this. They're just so weak you can't detect them because my hand is not the mass of a black hole. Um, so, so any kind of astrophysical event where you have masses moving are going to generate waves. Um, within the galaxy, we should, for instance, be able to see supernova explosions and that would be very exciting if we did. Because core gravitational collapse, waves, supernova. core collapse supernovas, yes, core collapse supernovas. Thank you, Jess. Because, um, because those are the type that move lots of mass at once. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. Um, and so the important thing in the terms of gravitational waves, I think, is that the, um, the waves, the gravitational waves will propagate immediately out of the supernova, whereas all the other ways that we observe for supernovas, neutrinos, light, and everything, are delayed a little bit. And so it's a very prompt way of, of, of seeing and understanding what's going on as the supernova collapses. So we would love to see a supernova in the galaxy. Uh, we'll see if it happens. Not too close by, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not too close by, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm looking at the uh, chat window. <laughs> okay, so here's one from Nishant Mal... Malpani, sorry if I messed up your name, Darnell, with an exclamation mark. Why can't gravitational waves travel faster than the speed of light? Why? Why not? Jess? Shane? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think the right answer to that is that the, so, so the speed of light is an interesting moniker that we use in physics because the first thing that we knew traveled at that speed was light. But, in fact, the speed of light is not actually connected to light. It's actually something that's very fundamental about the structure of space-time. There's a limit to the way things can propagate through space-time. And that limit, that universal speed limit, what you and I call the speed of light because we first discovered it with light, is something about the way the universe is put together. And um, it's, you know, asking why is a difficult question. As physicists, the, the way we ask the question is, is it true? And so far in every experiment we've done since we discovered this in 1905 has demonstrated that, yeah, everything appears to travel slower than the speed of light. And that means gravity, gravitational waves. 
um, so far have, have always traveled slower than the speed of light as well. Okay, now this is why I like space fans. M. Matessa on the chat window has said, given us an answer, I'm not going to check your math, that it is 6 times 10 to the 24 duck lengths to the black hole. <laughs> so there you go, folks. You heard it here. That's how many duck lengths those things were far away. See, this is why I love, I love space fans. Thank you for that. Now, ta Tim Williams is asking, as a control engineer, I'm very interested to know how is seismic activity dealt with and how do you achieve such extraordinary dynamic range throughout the system? Now, Jess, you were commenting on this earlier, but is there something that's specific to that question you can add to it? I think uh, that's a very good question, and it is precisely controls engineering that enables us to do this. Um, so we, I, like I mentioned before, um, actively isolate in multiple different stages the platforms that support our optic systems. Um, but yeah, I, I probably then would just proceed to regurgitate what I've said before. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to Yes. Yeah, so you got see yeah, these really as I said, the spin offs are going to be amazing from this too, I'm just predicting. Okay. Um, if uh, Greg School is asking if gravitational waves cause an uh, cause objects to slightly wobble, doesn't that mean some energy is transferred from the gravity wave to the object, and I guess that would kind of talk, speak a little bit about the stamping we were, we were discussing early in the hangout. Uh, anybody want to take that? Is, is, so, is energy energy transferred from the wave to the object? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you know, when you talk to gravitational physicists, right, this will be a matter of contention because the level at which energy is deposited depends on how far out, how many decimal points you take the calculation, right? But, but let, me, let me tell you something historical to answer that question. So after Einstein figured this all out, physicists were very confused for 30 or 40 years about whether or not gravitational waves were real and whether or not you could actually do something to detect them. And so the way this was resolved was at a famous conference in 1957 that we all call the Chapel Hill Conference, where a famous kind of thought experiment was proposed, which was if you have a, a long, thin rod, a piece of wire with two beads on it, and there's a little bit of friction between the beads and the wire, when the gravitational wave goes by, it would push the beads back and forth on the wire, and the beads would slow down, as a result of friction, which would show up as heat in the wire. And so the physics question then is, where did that energy come from? The only place it could have come from is the gravitational waves. So, so we really do think of them as, in, as depositing energy in the detector, but it de uh, deposits very, very tiny amounts um, that are indistinguishably small. But, uh, but they do deposit energy. That's how we, that's how we measure them. Awesome. So Tim Williams has a great question too. He's asking, gravity waves refract around masses. Do well. He's asking, do gravity waves refract around masses just as light does? Uh, what he's referring to is as a light ray goes around a uh, uh, a corner, or a, it can actually bend around uh, surfaces and things like that to diffract. Uh, does gravitational waves do they do that? Yeah, so gravitational waves do everything that photons do. Okay. Um, so, so if you know, uh, photons in the universe are lensed by you know uh, strong gravitational uh, fields emitted by or uh, generated by galaxy clusters or uh, you know massive cores in galaxies will lens objects, and so gravitational waves are expected to be lensed as well. Um, we would love to see a lensed gravitational wave object, uh, gravitational wave source. We don't know how likely that is. We'll see. But uh, to one of the earlier questions, which Alberto asked, which is, you know, we want to know how many of these things there are. When we start talking about sources that are cosmologically distant, uh, you know, we have to worry about the same kinds of statistical counting that yeah. astronomers worry about, and lensing is a part of that. So. Okay, Greg School's asking a question I, I meant to go back to um, in our discussion. He's asking, does this discovery confirm the existence of primordial black holes. But I want to take that a little step further because I've heard that what this also does is it proves conclusively the existence of black holes. And I guess prior to this, we they've always been very, um, they've been mathematical objects and they certainly explain a lot of the physical phenomena we see in the universe, especially with respect to uh, active, you know, the galaxy, galaxy centers. 
uh, and to and if it weren't a black hole that was doing those things, we have to invoke some pretty strange science. So this actually sort of settles the question, right? Black holes really do exist. Right? I think we'd all agree with that, right? So, so, so I you know, everything. Can we strange. talk? Go ahead, well, Tony. I just said I found that strange because I always thought we kind of knew this already, but I guess not really, right? I mean, not right. exclusively. So, so everything that you that we call black holes and know about black holes are observations of things responding to some enormous gravitational force in direct that method. we then infer is a black hole. Right. Right. But this was an observation that was made purely in terms of the gravitational signature of the object, of the gravitational waves, and that. That's, that's, that's a direct a black hole, right? That's a direct observation of the black hole because black holes, by definition, don't emit light. Okay. So, so that's so just strictly black holes. That's true, which is kind of awesome. Now, the other questions about primordial waves and primordial black holes, and that's a that's a, another. Topic I know, and I, you know what? I don't have time to get to it. I really wanted to talk about primordial waves as well, the primordial gravitational waves uh, that would have been, you know, sort of permeating the uh, background. But we don't have time for that. What? But it, no, I was going to say that it's also true that you know people have to understand that uh, LIGO detects uh, certain types of gravitational waves, not all the gravitational waves. Like uh, you know, like detectors uh, detect only some particular wavelength of light, right? So it, they're not sensitive to all gravitational waves ever produced in the universe. Well, that, that, so let's get to that. What's the future like for for LIGO? Are we going to be getting more wavelength ranges, more observations? Tell us about what's what's next now that we've made this initial, we've gotten over this initial discovery. What's the uh, what, what, what can we expect now? And Jess, can you so, come out? Sure. So I mentioned before a little earlier that right now we are not in an observing run. We just ended it in early January, and we are making some instrumental upgrades to prepare us for our second observing run. Um, we probably won't expect any huge jump in sensitivity between the first and second observing runs, but um, between the sensitivity we just saw in our last observing run and the design sensitivity, we do have some major instrumental upgrades planned, including but not limited to turning up our laser. So I mentioned before that it, it was used at 20 watts input power, and it's capable, um, at, it's designed to be capable of inputting 180 watts. So this would increase the amount of power circulating in the, uh, in the, the arms of the interferometer quite a lot, and um, we expect that to be very helpful at higher frequencies, but we have a lot a lot of prep work left to do before that happens. Um, so definitely not this coming observing run, but um, perhaps later. And then towards the future, I think there are there are a lot of people thinking about the sort of the next step, the third generation of terrestrial interferometers. So in addition to to Lisa and uh, other space technologies, I think yes, we're there's a lot of thought and planning going into sort of target sources and um, instrumentation and oh, what what should our next focus be and on Earth as you said before since Earth uh, does a lot of jiggling at very low frequencies um, we are fairly limited in what we'll be able to see um, so we'll look to Lisa to see the very low frequency waves well thanks for setting that up that's a good segue for the the next the thing I want to talk about but, but before I leave this real real quick David Joseph on Twitter is asking me is the distance between the mirrors in their interferometer affected by thermal expansion? That's a good question. What do you guys do about, uh, do you guys keep it very, very temperature sensitive? Yeah, so, so everything's actually hanging inside a vacuum. So it's like the largest vacuum system in the world. So there's, you know, one meter diameter beam tubes that are four kilometers long that are evacuated. So it's all hanging in vacuum. And so um, Jess can tell you probably about the thermal thermal controls at the end, but uh, but there there's no air in there at all. So all the thermal is is localized to the to the objects themselves. And do you so do you Jess do you do you guys keep things very temperature uh, controlled in there? I think I missed the start of this oh, question. The answer, um, well, I'm sorry. The question was on Twitter, and he goes, "Is the distance between the mirrors in the interferometer affected by thermal expansion?" Um, I mean, we're talking way, waste of an true. atom or a piece of an atom, so I mean, yeah. you know. So we we do see a thermal effect on our test mass position, but it's it's actually mostly vertical. So um, uh, the 
the vertical position of our test masses is, is very strongly affected by the temperature of the, the suspension that holds them. So between the, um, the final um, optic, which is what the light reflects from, and the stage above it, it's monolithically attached, um, monolithic silica. And what you can see, one of the best temperature sensors that we have for inside the vacuum chamber is um, the, how much the optic starts to sag. Um, but our, so inside the vacuum is not temperature controlled, but outside. So all the buildings that house instrumentation are. Okay. Well, we're almost, oh, we are out of time, but I want to mention space. We're going, the, we're, there's a, there's, there are attempts to put together a, what, and Jess already mentioned it, LISA laser interferometer space antenna, which is really cool. And um, there's, there are plans for that observatory to be built, but it's not being built yet. Instead, what we're doing is something called LISA Pathfinder, which was launched back in December. We had a hangout on it back in November, so watch that. Uh, and it is at the L1 point right now, and I uh, will let you take it away, Shane. What else we got to look forward to from LISA Pathfinder? What is it doing? So, Why Pathfinder, is it yeah, Pathfinder is kind of testing the core technology of LISA. So LISA is going to do in space what LIGO is trying to do on the ground, the interferometry for gravitational wave detection, only over much longer distances, over 5 million kilometers instead of only over 4 kilometers. And so Pathfinder is kind of testing what one LISA spacecraft has to do in terms of lasers and monitoring masses. And right now um, they're getting ready to release the test masses, which are the objects we're watching uh, the motion of to watch how they respond to gravitational waves. Um, I brought with me, I happen to have um, a model of one of the LISA test masses. So this is the exact size of the ones that are on Pathfinder and should be on LISA. It's uh, kind of a couple centimeters across and it weighs uh, a kilogram or so. Uh, the real ones are made out of gold and platinum. They don't let me touch those. Uh, this one's made out of tungsten, so it's about the same weight and it's pretty heavy. So I hope I don't drop it on my laptop. Uh, but right now, um, they've uncaged them, so they're locked down at launch. And you'll notice there's some little dimples on the end there. I don't know if you can see those. So those are dimples where little fingers hold this uh, when they release it. And uh, this week sometime, I think, they're going to pull those dimples away, and the test masses will be free-floating in space. And that's when the real experiment's going to start. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm glad we were able to get that in. And we will hopefully be having another Future in Space hangout with Shane et al. to talk more about Lisa Pathfinder and its results because it's, uh, that is the next stage in and this uh, this work, boy, can you guys believe it? I mean, now we live in a world where we have an entirely new branch of astronomy. There was remember exoplanets. We didn't know anything about exoplanets. Now that's a whole branch of astronomy. We of people coming up and studying exoplanets. Now we have gravitational wave astronomy. And the awesome thing about this is this is astronomy that you can't do or we never thought of because we don't have senses for this, right? This isn't right. like listening to things or seeing stuff. This is completely new, which yeah. is crazy. I know. So think about think about our future a hundred years from now. Yeah. Well, I, I hope. I, I'll, of course, I'll still be around, but I'll be. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll be I'll be raising ducks, but I'll I will be there. And uh, duck astronomy. That's that's the next big thing. Okay. Line in the mud. All right. Well, <laughs> Shane Larson and uh, and and Jess MacGyver, I want to thank you both very much for joining. This has been a lot of fun. I hope you'll come back. I hope we haven't scared you away. We really want to continue this discussion and talk more <laughs> about LIGO and gravitational waves. Uh, will you come back sometime and let us know? Give us updates. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a loaded question. You're like, I better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to say yes that's now, I, don't we? I know that's why I ask it when we're still alive. <laughs> you're already here first, folks. They're going to come back. All right, folks. Well, thank you all for watching. I'm going I'm to stop it here. We're already over time about, by about five minutes. Uh, I hope you'll join us next Friday where our Future in Space Hangout will feature Mike Brown and uh, Constantine Badigan, uh, where we're talking about this, the hypothetical, uh, as yet, uh, ninth planet in our solar system. So we hope to talk about what the latest results are and what the what the latest news is on that topic. In the meantime, that is what I just I'm just amazed. I want to thank all of you for your comments and questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them in the chat, but you guys were scrolling by pretty quickly. I am working on a better way 
I just don't know what that is yet. Um, I'm only given so many tools uh, to work with, and so I apologize if we didn't get to your question, um, but we hope you will still keep watching and uh, keep trying. So thank you very much. Alberto, Harley, we got another one in the bag. Yep. There you go. That was Excellent. awesome. Excellent. Thank that you was all. Awesome. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Jess. Right. Yeah. It was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you thanks. all. Thank you. Thanks. thanks, guys, very much for a very interesting hangout. All right, space fans. Well, that is it for this. Well, no, that's it for this hangout. We'll see you next Friday. Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep looking up. <laughs>